Hello everyone, uh, my name is Tudor Damien and I'm here to talk a little bit about one of my favorite topics, uh, hacking. Uh, before we get started, a little bit about me. I'm an IT consultant and trainer. I mostly deal with uh, topics around cloud strategy, cloud governance and cybersecurity. I'm a cloud and data center management MVP and a certified ethical hacker. Uh, I am also one of the co-founders of a really nice event uh, taking place every year in Transylvania, Romania. It's called IT Camp, and uh, also the IT Camp community behind it. And if you want to get in touch with me, um, you can find all my contact details on 2D.tel. But enough about me, let's get to the topic at hand. Um, Today I'll be briefly talking about the state of the industry um, and some of the ways in which cyber attacks are changing nowadays, uh, focusing on things like insider attacks, credential reuse, password spraying. Um, I'll run through a couple of demos and then we'll touch base on the assume breach approach, which even if it's not new in the industry, it's still uh, heavily underused uh, in a lot of companies out there. Uh, and then we'll uh, wrap things up. Um, now, this year was fun, right? Um, if you look at some of the things that happened since the beginning of the year, uh, we've had some major data breaches. Um, Twitter, Marriott, MGM Resort, Zoom got hacked a couple of times. Garmin had some ransomware take down a bunch of their infrastructure. DigitalOcean had uh, some of their customer data uh, published online, things like that. We also had some uh, new zero day attacks um, on different platforms and solutions on Bluetooth, on SSL and TLS encryption, on SMB. Um, one of the cryptocurrency wallet websites was uh, also hacked and around $5 million were stolen from people's wallets. Um, we saw an attack on the VOLTE uh, technology encryption and this is one of the newest things in mobile communication. Uh, Revolti uh, is an attack that aims to decrypt the communication on VOLT in real time um, so people can listen in on your encrypted or you're assuming they're encrypted uh, conversations. CPUs had better days, um, new side channel attacks affecting uh, pretty much every major CPU out there. And um, one of the fun things I've, uh, I've seen earlier this year is uh, an attack that was shown to be working where one can listen to your conversations from say across the street by watching the light bulb in your room uh, with no more than a telescope um, and some um, some devices behind it that uh, can take that light and interpret it and get the sound back from that. It's a very interesting. If you want to find out more about that, just search for lamp phone um, out there. And yeah, we also had COVID-19 uh, in case you, you missed it. But we're talking about cybersecurity today and um, uh, let's just focus on that. If you look at um, the past years, um, there's a bunch of other attacks, hacks, companies that have been hacked, zero days, um, different types of ransomware and malware that showed up. And um, a lot of the things on this slide are just a Google search away. If you want to find out more about a certain kind of attack or hack, just search for, for that. So there's a lot of things happening. And um, that's mainly because we're not really ready for, for a lot of these. And even if we have the right tools, if we have the right approaches, we rarely, if ever, apply them correctly. And starting with the fundamentals, um, when you talk about security, there's three uh, major concepts that that we uh, deal with. One is reaction. Oh my God, we've been hacked. What do we do? This is what most people and companies end up doing, unfortunately. Uh, they figure out they've been hacked. And in some cases, that takes months or even, even years to, to realize that, hey, I've been hacked two years ago, three years ago. Um, 
Then there's precaution where you try and prevent that from happening. And that usually happens after you get hacked. The first time you start thinking, so what could I do better? What could I do differently uh, so that I don't get hacked again? It's quite rare for people and companies to take these preventive measures uh, before they or someone they know uh, have been hacked. And one of the uh, areas where a lot of companies fail is making sure that all of the changes, all of the measures that you have in place are kept up to date, that you're not just in a set it and forget it mode where you do something and you think you've done enough and then you just leave it running the way it is and hope for the best. You have to remain up to date. You have to make sure that you know you're using the latest and greatest uh, tools, that they're up to date, that they're doing their job, that you're protecting against new types of attacks uh, showing up and things like that. And that's, again, quite rare. So reaction, something that a lot of people and companies do. The other two, not so much, and we'll see why that's uh, bad. Now, some... Um, some attacks are actually on the rise. And in past years, uh, insider attacks have been a major source of pain for a lot of companies. And when I'm talking about insider attacks, it's either somebody on the inside that has bad intentions and wants to do you harm, or somebody on the inside that just got hacked uh, by just clicking on a link that they shouldn't have. So now their computer is compromised, their account is compromised. So the hacker, the bad guy, or the bad guys now uh, launch their attacks from inside your infrastructure, from inside your network, using one of your own accounts. Uh, and that's how you can um, cause the most damage. If you have the login of somebody inside a company, you don't need to go and hack their firewalls and things like that. You can just log in through their own VPN and do your stuff there. Um, the problem with this is that not a lot of companies can detect these kinds of attacks because you always assume that if you're on our team, you're a good guy, I'm not going to look at you. I'm just going to try and protect from the unknown stuff outside. It's never the inside that I look at because I always assume that's safe. That's It's just people I know. It's devices I know. And it's very rare that companies monitor for that kind of abnormal user behavior. Or even if they detect it, it's hard for them to tell how big of an impact it had on their infrastructure or on their... On their um, uh, tools on their data and things like that. And uh, more often than not, endpoints and mobile devices are used to launch attacks. Now more than ever, with people working remotely a lot more than they did before, these kinds of attacks, the company laptop that you use to connect to your home Wi-Fi is still the company laptop. It's still a device that's allowed to connect to the company uh, network. So if you don't protect that properly, you might end up in trouble. Now, I'll be shifting the focus a little bit to a very interesting study. Um, the aim of this study is to perhaps try and convince people to think of their passwords more like they think about their underwear, which is you should change them often, you shouldn't leave them lying around, and you shouldn't share them. And while that is abundantly obvious with uh, underwear, or it hopefully is, um, it's not so much with passwords. Uh, passwords end up being reused quite a lot. Um, they end up being shared with coworkers, with family members, and that's how um, accounts get uh, compromised. But just looking at some of the questions that popped up in the survey, this is one of them. Uh, would you say that you have more pairs of underpants or panties or shorts uh, than you do passwords? Now, this study was uh, done across several countries uh, in the EU. Uh, so we can just look at some of the results there. Um, and while there are differences among these countries, it just goes to show that for all of them, um, the reality is that people have more underpants than they do passwords. So that means that 
people often reuse the same password or just add a one, two, three, four at the end or just like one of the upper row symbols, an exclamation point or a, an at sign or whatever. Um, that's not really a new password. It's something that's easily guessable by, um, by a hybrid attack, for instance. The second question here, speaking about your underwear and your passwords, how often do you change them? Now, I'm not expecting um, people to usually answer when, when we talk about this in a public forum, but the people that participated in the survey did answer, and this is, uh, this is the result. So it's two axes. If you're in the top right, it means you both change your underwear often and your passwords often so good job germany uh, i'm not sure what the uk is doing um well at least they're changing their passwords often um, and the third question uh, have you ever shared your underwear or password with a friend or member of your family and this is also where uh, things get interesting um at least looking at um uh, at the um uk and the shared underwear uh, question, at least they're not sharing that either. But even so, uh, even with all the differences, you can still see that things are uh, probably a bit worse than, than you imagine if you put them in, in this context. Now, the reason I've talked about passwords is uh, because password collections are a thing nowadays. So if you end up reusing your password on a couple of different websites, then you're already uh, in danger of having your accounts, all your accounts compromised if you use the same password or a small variation of it. Uh, to, to see that, you can just search for uh, collection one to five. Um, Anywhere on the internet, you should be able to easily find at least references to, to those collections. And those are not more than collections of emails and passwords from previous data breaches. So a website got hacked, uh, the usernames and passwords were made public on the internet, somebody went out there and grabbed all of these uh, lists and put them together in one big list. And the, the initial uh, collection, collection number one, had a little over 700 million pa emails and 21 million unique passwords. And that just goes to show that a lot of people actually use the same password. Uh, and there's really not much variation when it comes to that. Uh, that's already more than 2.7 billion pairs of emails and passwords that you'd be looking at. And the source of that was about 2,000 previous data breaches and a lot of new emails and passwords from unknown sources. Uh, collections two to five are already estimated to be three times the size of collection one after removing duplicates. So the, the collections of passwords out there are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and you just need to get the latest one and you get all the emails and all the passwords from most of the public data breaches in past years. Now you can also check uh, if your email or your password has been compromised in any of those data breaches, in any of those hacks. And a website that I often use and recommend is haveibeenpuned.com where you can either check whether your password or a password has shown up in any data leaks, but it won't tell you which email it belonged to. Or you can search for your email and it will tell you whether that email has been compromised in any known data breaches uh, and whether it contained any other information like your full name or your uh, credit card information or your password and was the password in clear text, was it hashed and, th and so on. So you can find out a lot of these things uh, by just going to haveibeenpune.com and searching for your email or password. You'll not get the email password pair, but you will get the info whether the email or the password has been compromised. There's a bunch of other places where you can uh, do this. Um, now, the relevance of this is that these types of leaks, these types of password collections lead to what are called credential reuse or credential stuffing attacks. Uh, credential stuffing is basically reusing these stolen credentials to automate login requests. And this allows hackers to 
try known pairs of email password combinations to hack into other websites. So if you use the same password uh, or a small variation of that password on another website, then that website gets hacked and you've got the same password for your email account or for your Facebook account, uh, it's easy for someone to get inside that account as well because it's basically reusing the same email and password that you use uh, someplace else. And if you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm adding one, two, three at the end, I'm adding like exclamation points and dollar signs and add signs and things like that, um, it's actually quite easy for, for any uh, tool to add those bits and pieces of random stuff at the end, like one, two extra characters, or to replace things like an E with a three or an A with a four or an L with a seven inside the password and try that. Uh, so if you think you're doing that and you're just making your password more secure, you're not really doing that. Um, we'll talk a bit about the solutions to that later on. But if you're one of the people that do this regularly, if you reuse your passwords or if you just change a little bit, if you have to change your passwords and add a 02 and 03 and 04 at the end, you're not doing it right. Another thing here is password spraying. Uh, and no, it's not a, a can of passwords that you use to spray around. It's a different type of attack. And this one's uh, becoming more and more uh, prevalent because of uh, lockout mechanisms or lockout policies present in different uh, tools and technologies and operating systems and websites. A lockout policy is basically saying if someone's trying to log in and they enter their password wrong three times or five times, just lock them out, uh, prevent them from, from logging in, or just throw a CAPTCHA at them to make it harder for them to, to try tens or hundreds or thousands of passwords until they get the right password. So these lockout policies is what makes automated brute force attacks harder and harder to perform because after you've tried three passwords, you are locked out and you can't try any new password on that account anymore. Password spraying um, does things a little bit differently. It just tries one password, like a common password, think one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, my research has shown that uh, around one to two percent of people use one, two, three, four, five, six at some point as their password, and that's one in fifty people or one in a hundred people. So all you have to do is try all the emails or all the usernames and just one password or or three passwords or however many passwords you know will not trigger the the lockout. So once you do that, if you say you try uh, 123456 against 1,000 email accounts, um, you're probably going to get into 10 or more of those accounts um, if you stick with the 1% um, statistic. So you may not need to hack that one particular account. You may just want to hack one account whatever that account is, so you just try one password against all these um, accounts that you know. There's also lots of tools out there that you can uh, use to automate that, and they're open source, they're freely available. You can find them in Kali Linux or as Bash scripts for Linux or in PowerShell scripts for Windows uh, to do these kinds of attacks on different, uh, on different areas. Now, with that being said, um, it's time to go to the to the fun part, to the demo, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, credential harvesting and MFA bypass in those demos. All right, so moving to the demo here. Um, the first one is actually a combination of multiple things that will be going on here. For one, I will be using what's called an ARP poisoning attack to try and convince the target, the target is the machine here on the right, which has this uh, .12 uh, IP right here. Uh, I'll try to convince that machine to f have some of the traffic flow through the, the uh, attacker's machine, through the hacker's machine, 
And I'll be doing that using ERP poisoning. It's a man in the middle technique. It's a Google search away. It's a five minute thing if you want to find out um, more about how that works. But this is the kind of attack that only works if you're on the same network as your target. Now, as long as I can convince the target to, to let the traffic flow through my computer, anything that's unencrypted, any protocol that's unencrypted, and that includes FTP, DNS, POP3, HTTP, um, things like that, um, I will be able to see everything in clear text without doing anything. Like if you were trying to log in over FTP, I will just get your password immediately. Uh, if you are trying to do anything over any unencrypted channel, I'll be able to, to see that. And DNS requests are such a thing. So if you're trying to ask where, say, Facebook or LinkedIn is, uh, I'll tell you that, hey, you know what? Facebook and LinkedIn are actually here on my PC. So I'll be using a tool called EtherCap for that. And this is the, the config for it. Um, I've configured it to say, hey, Facebook and LinkedIn are on this IP and we'll be using LinkedIn for this, um, this demo. Um, now, the first thing I need to do is I need to make sure that I have a copy, a clone of uh, LinkedIn uh, on, on this uh, IP. So for that, I'll be using another tool called the Social Engineering Toolkit. I'll be doing a website attack vector, credential harvesting, site cloner, LinkedIn. So this one goes out there, takes a copy of the LinkedIn website. And now if I were to open up a browser uh, and just go to uh, 192.168.200.10, which is the IP of the attacker, I will be getting uh, what looks like the LinkedIn login page. And it's a, a clone of it, a uh, one-to-one -one copy of the existing login page. Now, it's going to be harder for me to go um, in the hotel lobby or at my local Starbucks and tell everyone there, hey, you want a faster Facebook or faster LinkedIn? Just go to this IP instead. I won't be able to do that. But if I can trick their computers into thinking that LinkedIn is actually on this IP, um, I might just be able to, to have them do something that they will probably later regret. And the way I, I will do this, as I mentioned, is I will be doing uh, this with EtherCap. Uh, I'm going to start the sniffing. I will be looking at who's on the same network with me. Uh, and I have found that it's the gateway and the, the target. It's not showing my IP because I'm not going to hack myself. So I'm going to tell it, if you see any sort of traffic going in between these two, try and get it to flow through you and also use that DNS spoofing uh, setting that I've uh, shown you before. If there's a DNS request for LinkedIn, just tell that target that, hey, LinkedIn is actually on this IP. So once that's done, I'm going to start ARP poisoning. And hopefully um, this, uh, this gets to trick my computer into thinking that LinkedIn is on this IP. So let's go into like a command prompt and try and ping LinkedIn.com. And as expected, LinkedIn.com now responds to that IP on the network because as you can see here, the DNS spoofing worked and LinkedIn was spoofed to this IP. So now if I go into a, a, a new browser tab and go to LinkedIn.com, it will open LinkedIn.com, right? Wrong. It's the website, the clone that I've just created here. And the one thing that will tell me is this little thing like right here telling me that connection is not secure. So it's not over HTTPS because I need things to go over HTTP as it's easier for me to get any passwords and whatnot. You can do it over HTTPS, but you'll have to um, have uh, a certificate that's trusted in the browser or you'll have to have the user accept that untrusted certificate and that's a clear sign that something odd is going on on your network. But if you don't notice this thing in the corner, if you don't notice this and you just log in and you try to uh, log in 
with just a username and password, and I didn't use the correct ones for a very good reason. Uh, and if I were to maybe try this again, let's see. I need to search for it. Let's see if I try this again. Maybe it's uh, it finds it because it gets all the requests here. And if I uh, let me try it in a different browser, maybe because I would have to search through all the logs. LinkedIn.com it works here as well. Let's see if this captured anything that's easier to spot. Let me scroll. There we go. I think I saw it. Yes. Uh, it was probably there before as well, but it's harder to spot. Uh, so whenever you do any sort of request, it tries to figure out whether there's anything that looks like a password field or uh, something that you either transmit over the wire. And it does tell you this is what I entered. It was the wrong password, and that was my um, email. Now, I can also set it up so that once you log in, you're redirected to the real website. And if you were logged in there, it, you won't know that this even happened. It's just, oh, okay, I need to log in again. Sure, I will log in again. So you do. And then once you are logged in on my website, on the hacker's website, you redirect it to the real one, you're logged in there, but I've also got your password. Now you'll say, well, but I've got multi-factor authentication, so I don't really care about this. I don't care if you know my password because you also need my uh, phone number uh, or my, my phone where I will get uh, the multi-factor authentication request on my phone number and I will uh, only be able to log in if I have that as well, and you won't. Uh, for this, there's uh, something else that uh, that you could do, and this is um, using a tool called Evil Gene X. Now, Evil Gene X is actually a modified version of Nginx, X, which acts as a transparent proxy, and it essentially gives you a real-time copy of the real website but it's going through it through a different domain that you own and that you've also generated the uh, certificates for. It's using Let's Encrypt for that. So I've actually bought a domain called authorization.co.ro. I've configured it to point to the machine uh, that's running this tool. And I've also configured, and you can see that it knows to do a lot of things so you can attack any of these things, Facebook, Instagram, Amazon, Reddit, Outlook, and so on. We'll also be using LinkedIn for this. So I've configured LinkedIn, and it's quite a, an easy to, tool to use. Uh, if, uh, if you look here, it's just like configuring the tool and then configuring these fishlets and lures and then looking at the sessions that it captured. It's very well documented, so it's, it's quite easy to use. Uh, but what I've done is I've told it to uh, have this link, uh, and this is this link right here, uh, have this link take me to a page that's actually linked in right now, um, and it's, it's taking it and it's displaying it to you through a transparent proxy with my own um, certificates. Now, for this, I don't need to be on the same network as you. This is a phishing attack. So all I need to do is make you click on this link and make you think that this is actually LinkedIn. So if the target uh, ends up, and I'll just uh, close and just restart the browser anew. So this is this is my uh, my target, and I will enter this uh, this link in the browser. This is HTTPS. It's not HTTP. Uh, let me, I, I probably need to stop this. I will shut this down. There we go. Uh, so the target right now is taken to this website. This website 
is actually LinkedIn. This is the LinkedIn login page, but it's on my domain, right? It's also HTTPS. So if you if you check it's secure, the the certificate is uh, is valid because it was just generated using Let's Encrypt. So if I were to try and log in, uh, and I will be using the victim at Gmail, and then I will be entering hopefully the correct password. And yes, it is the correct password because I've just received an SMS. And let me enter the token. So now I'm logged in. This is my LinkedIn account. Um, and it's my actual LinkedIn account for this, uh, for this user. Um, and it's... And you can see it's John Victim, right? And it's got one contact, which is me, right? Uh, but I'm I'm on his account, so I can I can do whatever. I'm on my account here, like I'm the victim, uh, so I can do whatever because this is the valid LinkedIn. However, one thing happened. It got the username and password, and the authorization tokens. And what I can do with the authorization tokens, let's say um, I'm looking at the sessions and I will be looking at sessions three, which is the one from today. And you can see it captured the username, the login, and yes, it did need the, the, the token, but it also gave me something along these lines, which is uh, which is more than enough for me to do something else. And let me open up uh, a new window here. This is on my computer. And I'm going to LinkedIn. So this is LinkedIn, right? Uh, I'm not signed in. But what I can do is I can get, and I'll delete all the cookies, and I'll add my own. And I'll just get the info from this. This is the name. It's HTTP only true. Domain is www.linkedin. The expiration is valid. And I'll just keep the value in the value field. So I'm, I'm setting up the cookies that you get after you log in, after you've entered your password, and after you've entered the, um, the uh, MFA token. And when I refresh the page, I'm logged in as John Victim. So this is, um, this is how MFA bypass works. All right, getting back to our slides here. Um, just to quickly wrap things up, um, you've seen a bunch of attacks and how they work. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about how to prevent or help with this. One, as I mentioned in the beginning, is the assume breach mindset. Uh, try and think as if the breach has already happened and try and act like it as well. Try and use the tools and the procedures and the processes uh, to, to help you with that as if you've already been hacked. Think, hey, so I've been hacked yesterday. How can I detect that? I've been hacked five minutes ago. Is there anything I can do right now to tell if I've been hacked? And starting from there is, uh, is all about just doing war game exercises, doing live pen testing, doing uh, exercises around incident response, recovery, and things like that in a more structured manner. Also, as long as you start implementing this assume breach approach, uh, you will end up uh, learning a lot more about the current attacks, the tools you need to detect and prevent those, uh, the tools that the hackers use to attack you. So as long as you've got a process behind it, you're good. So the first thing you need to do is 
try and select a team, find a team, and start developing that process if you don't have it already. Uh, and as part of that, one of the central things is creating an incident response plan. You need to be able to easily discover and confirm that, hey, yes, an attack has happened, we've been hacked, contain that and keep everything running in the best way possible, then remove uh, any traces of the malware of the whatever the hackers did, uh, recover from that and see whether there's anything you've learned that you can apply for future uh, incidents. It's not a matter of if you get hacked, it's usually a matter of when you get hacked and how soon you find out about it. Now, as far as passwords go, try and not reuse them. This, I hope, is fairly obvious from uh, from what we've talked before. Using a password manager will help you with both remembering those passwords that you don't have to remember anymore, changing passwords, making sure you've got a unique password for every website and it's complex and long enough so that it's not detected uh, through like uh, a regular password spraying or credential stuffing attack because it's one, two, three, four, five, six. It's something way more random that nobody's ever used before, or it's very unlikely that it's been used before if it's randomly generated. Trying to stay up to date with the current attacks, like how to prevent insider attacks on your network in real time, how MFA can be bypassed and what you can do about it. Uh, try and educate your users because still over 90% of people have trouble distinguishing a, a really well-written phishing email from a legitimate one. Make sure you start using that assume breach approach and that you have a cybersecurity incident response plan because anything is better than doing nothing. Anything you do is better than just waiting to be hacked and seeing how you respond to that. And with that, I thank you very much. Um, if you've got any other questions, if you want to discuss this topic or any other topics on cloud security governance, cybersecurity further, my contact details are on 2D.tel. Thank you.